the Grey Hat Beard podcast. Hello and welcome to show 26 of Grey Hat Beard, the modern workplace podcast where we talk about all things Microsoft 365. My name is Kevin McDonnell. I'm the Grey of Grey Hat Beard. I'm a solutions architect at CPS. My name is Alan Erdley. I'm the hat of Grey Hat Beard uh, and head of modern workplace at CPS and an MVP as well. And my name is Gary Schwinder. I'm also a solutions architect at CPS. I am the beard of Grey Hat Beard. Uh, I'm also a, a Microsoft Office Development MVP and member of the PNP team. And we have a guest this week. Michael, would you like to introduce yourself? Awesome. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Basarek, and I am the uh, CEO at Orchestry. Fantastic. And we'll be talking about that because uh, this week, I, I'm stupidly giving this a bit of a mouthful of a show, but we're planning in the second half to talk about when and why you should use a third party product with Microsoft 365. So you've seen many of the good products out there and the great ones such as Orchestry. Um, and you wonder, what's the point? Why do I need to bring in and spend more license and money? What are the questions I should ask? What are the sort of things I should look at? We'll be talking about that in part two. But in part one, we're going to pick up the latest news and what we've been up to. Now, I've had a rather busy time for it at the moment because uh, my wife is an NHS pharmacist here in the UK, has been doling out vaccinations to people. And at the same time as that, my son's nursery decided to close down because they had COVID. So I've been juggling all sorts of meetings, stressing about what to do, trying to keep the little blighter quiet while I've been talking to all sorts of clients uh, and failing miserably, including saying, oh, no, poor piglets to uh, a fairly senior person at an organisation, uh, which was highly entertaining. But it brings me neatly on to something that got announced today, and that's the Microsoft Work Lab. So they've released this, um, oh, what do you call it, a thing, digital magazine, I think they've, they've talked about it as, called Work Lab, that's looking at the science of work and ingenuity, as they say there. So it's a set of articles looking at different topics around meetings, trying to drill a bit more into the science. And there's a nice one about going remote. And obviously Microsoft has a lot of stats and numbers that they've been crunching. We've we talked about Jared Spatero sharing things before. Um, and here is just some nice, interesting articles talking about the different topics. I think it's a lovely one for those who can see on the screen, the communication breakdown. So during COVID, we've seen the, the frequency of scheduled meetings increasing by 50%, uh, sorry, 51% of people have seen an increase in meetings, whereas it's the other scale, feeling socially connected to my team, people have uh, felt that drop, uh, that ability to brainstorm has dropped, knowledge flow within my team. A lot of those things that you know, we, we talk about having those open plan offices and what a pain in the backside and you want to be able to focus, but the benefits of some of those things are what's um, been disappearing slightly. So I thought it was interesting to see some of these articles. I think this is really important stuff because this is this is kind of the uh, the digital exhaust that we all leave when we're actually working within Microsoft 365. So Microsoft have a massive amount of information around how we work and, and how we're changing. And, you know, this is all sort of the, the data that's driving things like workplace analytics, but to bring it into a more easy to understand format, this sort of magazine format with articles, but obviously they're they're leading thinkers, you know, they're, they've got uh, all sorts of people in there um, who are responsible for things like together mode. So, you mm. know, if you if you looked at the um, the Netflix program around um, you know, the threat of the Internet, then uh, you'll re you'll recognize the bearded fellow with the glasses, um, Jared Lanier, who's you know one of the, the leading thinkers. So they're really trying to bring this forward and make it you know, the thought leadership for this this modern ways of working and how we change the way we work to adapt to, you know, the changing circumstances that we find ourselves in. It's it's vital that this kind of information comes out. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's good that, I mean, you just scrolling there, Kevin, the last kind of bit that we saw was a bit in bold that said, you know, control your meet, control your calendar, you know, <laughs> break out. And we, we've talk, been talking about this for months and, you know, now it's kind of like the, almost the science is backing up that, you know, what we're saying is like, actually, yeah, no, you, you should be doing this. Don't just, you know, just, don't just kind of keep going and be like, oh, you know, I'm always in meetings, you know, actually fight back, <laughs> control your calendar. And, uh, and it really helps because, you know, all those metrics seem to be uh, backing up 
all of the things that uh, that people have been trying to do. And I think everyone's been trying to find their own way in remote mm. working. Um, so hopefully this is going to be, like you say, a bit more digestible for, for everyone and, and kind of the science, but the actual tips and tricks of, of how to... Uh, just, just in case you want to get under the hood, they do have a formal white paper, which is lots and lots of words and lots and lots <laughs> of science there as well, just to take away from all the bright colours. The full geek out. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and I would I would say to, not, not to counter Gary, but for those of you who are struggling to control your calendar. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you there. I, I think Gary's been doing a great job at controlling his. Uh, I've been doing OK at times, but my focus time keeps getting nicked by by various people. It's not easy. It's not a simple thing. I know it's it's always good when people read these great textbooks and talk about the right thing to do. Um, if you're struggling with it, keep going, keep trying it out because it's. Not a simple yeah. turn on. And I, I think uh, one tip that Al's uh, got me doing as well is that morning commute. So going out for a walk in the morning as if you were commuting to an office, take that that bit of time uh, when I enjoyed the sunrise with my son uh, this morning. It was great. Yeah. I think it's a case of knowing the path and walking the path, right? Two yeah. completely different things. You can read about it and go, yeah, that's great. But, you've, you know, again, habits, right? It's building those habits and getting used to it. And that is that's the difficult bit, um, yeah. definitely. So ho hopefully we're giving you a bit of a reminder if you're listening to this and uh, a bit of encouragement. It can be done, um, but it's not blooming easy either. It's not. No, <laughs> I agree. Uh, I think in other news, Al, there's there some nice uh, DLP and protection and compliance uh, updates oh, that yeah. came out this for, week. For the nerds out there who enjoy the uh, the security and the compliance side of things, yeah, Microsoft released some, some playbooks and some accelerators, some ways to, for organisations really to to help them consider what they should be doing um, and some great ones that are just focused around you know Microsoft Teams so the data loss prevention playbook just for Microsoft Teams so it's some really good tools just to to make it easier I mean I know I've had many conversations with clients around this it's not easy stuff you know the data protection officer understands it the compliance officer understands it nobody else really really wants to take <laughs> the time to understand it and users never want to understand it because it's just going to make their lives more difficult. But these are some really, some really good tools just to get you up and running uh, and just to make it easier to digest and, and to communicate some of these out. So, yes, yeah, some really good stuff that they've they've put out. And I think they're doing this kind of carries on a trend of just trying to make this stuff easier because we're all remote now. It's more important now than ever um, to think about this stuff. So, yeah, it's really, really useful, really useful and I information. Think and I think there's a bunch of these, Alan, that they're releasing all around the, the security yeah. and compliance stack, which is, like you said, which is awesome because this stuff is pretty difficult and I think esoteric a little bit to understand. And it's a little bit like records management, right? No one's really yeah. interested in records management apart from the records managers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I think I think this is the exact same thing and putting it with some just some simple steps and scenarios like they have here. I know that I was looking at this and it, it finally started to click. Otherwise, yeah. it's a whole collection of documents and stuff all over the place so this is definitely the way they should be going and that's it you know they're, they're trying to make it easier so that everybody understands it you know it's it's always the art isn't it i think we all do it as consultants you know we have to try and translate the the technical magic that we do and actually convince people to to use it uh, and that's what this is really doing it's trying to convey what it actually is and rather than how it actually works and I, th I think Joanne Klein made a, a good point on Twitter uh, that sort of sparked a bit of debate the other day that th there is such a divide between IT and records management uh, and it's trying to bridge that gap. And so many organisations, they're so separate from each other. They're, they're often arguments and wanting different things. Uh, and I think if you throw users as the, the third part of that triangle, you know, there's there's requirements for IT, there's records management, want to manage everything and users just want to get things done. Uh, what I love about this is it's that user experience. So it's a reminder, it, it's identification for users themselves to say, these are the kind of things we should be thinking about records management. Then for record managers, it's don't forget the user experience in all this. If you're Absolutely. if you're capturing stuff, make sure people know why you're capturing it, make it as easy as possible. Don't just force people to do lots of boring stuff because they won't, they'll find ways around it. So making it easy is such a critical part to it. 
No, I think some um, nice things there. And you, you also pick something about data match. Uh, which I yeah, was... this is intriguing. So one of the things that, you know, we look at with compliance is, you know, how we can automatically label things um, and how we can actually identify content and say, actually, we're making it easier for the user. We can automatically label it. You know, when you're typing away, something comes up, a sensitivity label will automatically pop up. But this exact data match is another way to basically do that matching. So rather than just having a regex expression that actually defines, you know, a, the format of a credit card number, this is actually searching for information and actually really kind of taking it to the next level and using search techniques to actually mm. find this information, um, which adds all sorts of potential capabilities to say, how do I find content? Again, making it easier for users, not having to actually really think about having users say, well, what do I need to label this as? What retention policy should it have? This allows us just to say, yep, yeah, there's another algorithm we can use. It's defined around search and we can actually find find content in documents rather than actually ask people to to label things. And I thought it was it was interesting. I noted on the the article there that it talks about that this has been an option in PowerShell uh, up to now, so you could do it. This is another we were talking about PowerShell and automation last week. It's another great example where they went PowerShell first. Now they're following up with the UI so others can do it as well. Um, I, I do also notice, Gary, it talks about PowerShell and the command line. I was, I was waiting for you to make a, a rude comment about it not really being command line there, but uh, we'll, we'll let that one go for them. <laughs> Still type it into a prompt, doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> Same stuff. <Exactly. laughs> but no, but I, yeah. I thought it was interesting. Uh, and I and I oops, don't know what I'm clicking on there. Um Al, you your your speaking on entitlements will will cover later, but we, we were talking before the show and sort of seeing which news and things. And Michael, you noted something on managing guest access with access reviews. Uh, which kicked us off all to debate slightly as to whether this was something new or something that's been around for a while. Uh, certainly not something I think is w well known about. No, I mean, I'm not sure if it's new. It's something that came across, I think, my desk simply because of the, the change that Microsoft is making to default uh, guests to to allow, which is a little bit different than, than deny or to enable them by default into, into new instances of, of M365. So this I found super useful. I know that I think guest access is a pretty big challenge for a lot of organizations. I think most organizations don't understand how big of a challenge it is and what's going on with inviting guests in and the life cycle around guests and then, you know, uh, people sending out links, which may be anonymous and so forth. But I thought that was uh, I thought this was pretty interesting and looks like some good capabilities also. Um, just the licensing is interesting as usual, being part of a being part of a different different uh, license. You, you had to say the old uh, word. You had to yeah, bring well. that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I so think this I think this has, I, this I has say, been uh, around for quite a while. I mean, the 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 access reviews we've used them with with extranets, um, and yeah, you're right. The licensing is a challenge. It's Azure AD P2, um, but I think it's it kind of. As you say, with the change to say that you know the default sharing for Teams is going to be open, you know external users can be uh, added in by default. Access reviews are really powerful then to be able to you know set them up so that you're actually reviewing those guest access, uh, but then automatically revoking revoking it if they're not actually renewed. So it's really it's a really powerful tool to kind of compensate for you know that open access that uh, that Microsoft are putting out. But I guess we should probably yep. think about sensitivity labels as well, because you can use those to control, <laughs> you know, what the, the teams would actually allow as well. So that's and that's relatively new in terms of allowing locking them down. So you can't share them, can't actually share content as well as allowing guest access. Yeah. And a brilliant sales technique as well by Microsoft of enabling this stuff and then offering you a paid solution to be able to manage it. So uh, bra <laughs> bravo to whoever's yeah. thinking on the commercial side over there. Create this, create the problem, sell the solution. I mean, you know, where could you go wrong? Exactly. <laughs> Genius when you look at it like that. Um, you, you touched on teams there and the, uh, the the amount of usage. The the other numbers which I saw and a little bit UK focused. So 
apologies to any international listeners, but um, NHS Digital released a tweet saying it's been a busy start to 2021 and they're, they're, they've been using Microsoft Teams and they put out some numbers saying that between the 1st of January and the 15th of January 2021, 1.2 million calls were made, 2.5 million meetings hosted and 13.3 million chat messages sent, which is absolutely huge. There were unconfirmed rumours that 13 of those 13.3 million were actually hello. Um, but uh, hopefully there was some decent content in there as well. But j just to see one organization's usage being talked about there, I mean, it's massive and I'm sure that's been used a lot for, um, we're obviously going through a fairly hefty COVID numbers here in the UK at the moment. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of parts of the NHS under a lot of stress and um, just, they're using Teams to make that better. Just, just for those international users, well, uh, listeners, the NHS is obviously the healthcare service in the UK, so you know, you. they are under a lot of strain actually delivering the services. Um, so it's quite intriguing that they're using Teams quite so much um, as they uh, adopt a new technology, as well as coping with the medical the medical emergencies as well. It's quite it's quite surreal because they said they've had two hundred twenty thousand users on. And then it's around about 200,000 meetings a day if you do those calculations as well. So it's like every user is in almost one meeting a day, which God, is, that would that's be a nice. lot of, that, yeah, that would well, be, well, that that would be lovely. Oh, I was exactly. going to say that would be lovely. <laughs> and, and unless it's skewed completely and there's, you know, 10% of people are having 90 or 20% of people are having 80% of meetings, but that's a lot of meetings. I, I'm shocked. I thought, you know, People actually do real work; they don't just sit around doing meetings. Oh, but that's—I wonder it's, if they're using it. I wonder if they're using it for telehealth and all of those other yeah, capabilities as well. I was going to say, I mean, the, the, uh, doing the ward much. rounds and doing meetings, yeah, you know, that yeah, kind yeah. of. There's just all those templates in Teams just for, just for the medical profession. So yeah, it would be really interesting to have a, a bigger breakdown, wouldn't it, to see? Oh, I pressed that button. That's that was a mistake. <laughs> it's not really a meeting. <laughs> And the other half that shouldn't have been a meeting should have just been an email. <laughs> um, I, I thought that brought with it, Gary, you, you noted from the uh, the message centre some changes to the uh, share experience for meetings as well. Yeah, so they're, they're making it easier, which is good because every time I go to try and share my screen, I just get tons of different options. You're scrolling up and down. Uh, I only, only have one screen, so sharing my desktop isn't that bad, but sharing individual applications, um, I do quite a bit. Um, and uh, yeah, you're always kind of searching. So they're actually simplifying that now to just give you two options really, um, and, and be able to break out the number of, um, like it says, on, uh, it's got on the screenshot, it's, it's kind of got them stacked now uh, on top of each of us so you can select uh, your screen or, or particular application a, a, a bit a bit more easily so yeah i think it's a it's a good change um to to simplify that i think um yeah lots of people have issues sometimes when it comes to sharing it should be really easy um <laughs> but uh, sometimes the ui is just get in the way right I, I, they look kind of nice but um sometimes cause more problems but yeah it's uh, it's a good change i think yeah, it feels like a, a a small one of those simple but could be quite impactful. I, I think like the the other one I've liked is the reminder you've got time left. So that I think we've talked about before. Little thing, yeah. but it, it always it's a nice reminder that you're about to finish up and yeah. need to have that conversation. Get it in there quickly. And that that was an interesting one because I actually I actually saw a tweet uh, from uh, Chris Kent who uh, tweeted, "Oh, when did this five minute thing arrive?" <laughs> and I was kind of like that that's just arrived like i've just got used to it now being there um yeah. so you know those little things yeah it's, it's strange because we're all on different rings as well all different uh you know we we get access to different um features at different times mm. so it's interesting to see sometimes the lag on some of these features of how long it takes to to reach kind of the you know standard release tenants um but yeah um it, it, you know there's tons of changes coming in teams um but it, it's good i think it, this seems to be a bit more of a change based on the you know the other changes in the ui like um the uh, uh the reactions that's all kind of at the top so they're, they're kind of standardizing that because the share is kind of down at the bottom 
Um, mm. It feels a bit odd now with everything moved up to the top. So, so I think yeah, it's uh, it's along those yeah, lines. I think it's just move mind. people's faces to be at the top when you're sharing. So you're looking on oh. the face instead of looking down. Then we'd all be happy. Yeah. How many times are you you're sharing something and you're looking in the bottom corner of your screen? Yeah. Not at the camera. And you, you, I, you, I know every time and I catch myself and I'm like, oh, I've done it again. But yeah, please just move people up to the yeah. top. It's it's Maybe that and camera. moving the notes from PowerPoint to the top. So when you're reading notes that you're looking at those rather than very obviously looking to one side. Yeah. Small tweaks well, will make a lovely difference. And also the other thing is moving leave and share away from each other. So you don't <laughs> accidentally <laughs> press. Press. I don't know how I think I do that at least once a yeah. week. It drives me. It drives me crazy. I mean, it's yeah. that share button should not be next to leave. Just put leave somewhere else. Um, it's, yeah. I think it's it's far too close. And because it's so big, I think subconsciously it's like you almost want to, you know, it's like when you're standing you on the meet. edge of, yeah. of, of a building, you're almost, you kind of want to jump. But I think oh, I have that same sort of reaction. The big it, red it, button syndrome. The big, it's a it's big red button. Yeah, it's big red button syndrome. It's the biggest thing up there. Exactly. I do have one of those USB big red buttons uh, that someone bought me as a joke present. And uh, I need to find a good use for it. Maybe that's it for leaving meetings. I could just say slam. <laughs> it's not a bad idea. I did see I, I, I might try and find it for the show notes. Someone had made their own um, stream deck from Raspberry Pi. Um, and uh, they they made they had a little touch screen for it and they developed their own one for sort of teams. So they had the, the big buttons on the device there. I thought that was quite nice. Yeah, I saw, saw that one as well. That did look good. A couple of uh, while we're here, a couple of other updates I can see from the message center. So uh, updates coming to the SharePoint site usage report, um, which sounded interesting, but they're a little bit cryptic, saying that there's going to be eight new metrics, but not saying what they are. Uh, anonymous link count. I don't know what anonymous link count is within. What would be the number of anonymous links to documents within that site? What's an anonymous link? One that anyone one, can click on? Or... Yeah, one that you. Uh, I hate. I hate to sound kind of condescending, but it's one that's anonymous. <laughs> you well, no, no, it's, it. it's because I was thinking you can't have anonymous users in SharePoint Online, which is why it was. Well, no, you, you, yeah, you can share. You can share a document that anyone um, can access. I guess. Yeah. Link, so yeah. you're anonymous, but we know you've clicked on it. So not that anonymous, really. Um, well, we know your IP address, but you don't have to. Yeah, yeah, and who you are. But uh, apart from that, it's all OK. Um, I, I spent many hours trying to, div to find a solution where people could anonymously submit things. Uh, and I'm going to stop trying to say that word this time of night. Um, <laughs> what was the other one? There was Gary. You noted the one about Microsoft Teams will soon queue sent messages when offline, which I thought was interesting. I assume that's the web app, is it? For web and desktop. Oh. So. Yeah, that's that's quite interesting for anyone who's been having fun with their internet in the last few days. Uh, that could that's, be very helpful. I was going to say, or anybody who's travelling, if anybody's yeah. still travelling. <laughs> yeah, when, when that happened. It's funny, though, when you think about it, you look at it and go, how is that not there? <laughs> it's one of those features that, you know, I think Skype did it. It, it kind of like if you mm. sent a message and it couldn't quite get there, it was like, you know, you got the message saying, oh, you know, I'm going to send it in, in a while. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting when you kind of think, Teams is so like dependent on a connection um, that when you lose it, you know that's it, gone. Yeah. yeah. It, it, you, there's no there's no fallback anywhere. Um, so yeah, it'd be interesting to see whether they do more with that. And finally, the biggest news of the week: SharePoint Spaces to be available by default in the new menu, so we can create even more SharePoint Spaces and sorry, buy sorry, even what? more. What, I mean, what, what's more this? than one. <laughs> <laughs> For those who, who don't know, SharePoint Spaces is the um, ability to create a 3D view within a page of content and you can put nice, pretty content and scroll around it, do it once and then never see it again as far as I've seen on there. I, I'm kinda, this, I, I, I like that Microsoft like... innovated here, but is, yeah. It, mm, is this going to yeah. be a bit like the wiki in every team's channel the first thing that you're going to go in and do is take away that link to sharepoint spaces michael's yeah. thinking add that to the orchestra backlog quickly excellent <laughs> no oh, that, probably, reminds, yeah. that reminds no. me of a tweet that i saw though about there's a new beta coming for the wiki yes yeah um, well, it's, 
it's, it's out there, it's, except when you try to add it, it uh, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't do anything, <laughs> no. So it's not. I, I don't. I don't think the uh, team's wiki people are doing themselves any favors, unfortunately. <laughs> no. Uh, in fact, now remind way. me, we had a conversation about this. Going, why is this thing even here? Why is it even a default? <laughs> it was like, oh, there's something new coming, and then we just went. Actually, the original thing is terrible, and it should be burned. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Taken away right now. But yeah. I mean, it's interesting the the SharePoint spaces. We've got a couple of customers where it saved them a ton of money because they didn't have to buy AutoCAD viewers for design files. Um, but that's the only use case I've seen. So I mean, I'm sure I'm I'm sure there's others, but for them, people in engineering and people that are using AutoCAD for drawings, that saved them a ton of money because they didn't because these AutoCAD viewers are apparently hideously expensive. So yeah, they found really it bad. they found yeah. they found it pretty useful. Um, but apart from that, I mean. For the what would we say 99% of I guess standard use cases, you know, someone who's working I don't know in the NHS, they're going they're gonna in between their 200,000 meetings every every day. Um, now they're going into SharePoint and creating spaces. I think it's going to be uh, the, it's going to be only interesting. Use case I could think of that we we tried to get a previous organisation. Um, someone I, I think they they worked in the team that basically got to buy fun gadgets had bought a 3d camera um as an essential work item uh but the thought was that you could do a video going through all the offices so that when you were going to a new office you could have a look around it and you'd be familiar with it and i thought that was quite nice thing like great can we put that video on sharepoint no um so there, there was no way to actually store that video and i about six months ago, I did see Stream was talking about putting 3D video, so I don't know if that's in there. Be be interested to know if you can now put those into um, it, into that sh that SharePoint spaces. That that could be a use case, but uh, stretching it slightly, I'll admit. See, I'm just a complete cynic of 3D. I remember the 3D TVs, and everyone's like, "Oh, every TV you got it got 3D in it." And I've even got glasses downstairs that's like, have I ever used them? No. They, have I ever watched anything? Are they red no. and green ones? No, no, the, the, the new on ones. They're not, you know. Aging myself slightly there. Yeah, just a bit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it always gets me. It's just like, it's a bit with the VR stuff. It's so niche. I bet it's really cool. But when it comes to, you know, applications uh, just for, you know, normal use cases it, it really really it is, but i think that's the thing isn't it it's like your ex the example michael around the the cad drawings you know when you have that use case it really stands out as being something really useful when mm. you don't yeah it's yeah. it's just for the sake of it isn't it but those use I, cases I will probably was, grow over time but you'll never have it, a tv at home I, th I think certainly if you look back to, uh, I've forgotten the name of the Microsoft conference in the UK, but they certainly were pushing an awful lot with 3D about two, three years ago. Um, you know, there was a big push with HoloLens creating 3D content, paint 3D and that kind of thing. And I think it was supporting that. Unfortunately, it was on the latter end of that. And it's fair to say we're not really seeing it shout about quite so much anymore. So, uh, yeah, we'll see. Um, other, uh, there was a few bits of hardware news. We, we talked about the Consumer Electronics Show last week. Uh, I won't delve into the same conversation again too much, but uh, a few bits came out recently. The, the new Raspberry Pi Pico, um, which I thought was amazing, the, the $4 microcontroller for those who've seen the Arduino, uh, a, a little bit like that, a Raspberry Pi version of that. Um, I run a cup pack and there's something called the Microbits that was built in conjunction with uh, BBC, so a bit like the BBC micros of, of the 80s and things. Uh, I see this as that very simple way, teaching kids to think about electronics, to not just see the screen, to get involved in there. Four dollars, I think it's amazing, really. And the whole maker community that's in there, I think it's uh, really nice to see see stuff come from that. Uh, I know, Gary, you've, you've been looking a bit of internet things stuff with your, uh, uh, now I never know how to say, is it Hue, isn't it? Philips Hue uh light bulbs yeah so like I mean, a lot of people are kind of doing the home automation stuff and you just start with the the bulbs i just thought oh why not so i bought myself a starter kit and now i'm into a world of home automation and little raspberry pies to run all little servers and things so yeah I'm, I'm gonna get my head back into that um but yeah it's it's great i mean it's dirt cheap uh this stuff as well uh you get a full little computer as uh you know, I don't know if I'd say the hues are dirt cheap, but oh no, no, no! But the Raspberry Pi is <laughs> the yeah, Raspberry the, Pi, yeah. The absolutely. bulbs, the bulbs are not cheap, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but um, but yeah, all the the kind of the, the Raspberry Pi uh, 
kits that you can get. I think they the they released the keyboard um mm. version uh, I think before Christmas and that was mm. very much like, you know, that's taking me back to BBC and Acorns where you just got a keyboard, you connected it into something and you're away off. So obviously now much, much more powerful. <laughs> I'm not gonna get suckered to talking about Repton again there, Gary. Not sure. That's all I'm gonna that's all I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna <laughs> like, put Repton on it. That's it. Exactly. Play those. Um I'm gonna flick here through there, there were a couple of updates from CES. There was a nice new AMD Ryzen for those who love your chips. There's a nice new laptop. I'm scrolling through quite quickly. There was a nice new TV. Nothing that exciting. Caught my attention slightly. Uh, Ryzen decided to create a mask. So obviously trying to innovate in the mask world, but uh, intrigued to see that. And I, I was looking through this news and, and then I hit this picture and it had a picture of wine, which always uh, catches my eye. And it was called this Samsung Handybot. Uh, and apparently it's a, a bot. Uh, Samsung's working on a robot that can pick up laundry, load the dishwasher, set the table, pour wine and even bring you a drink. And uh, basically they can take my money. Uh, they, they've sold me on that if you can get it to work. I, I'd like to see it work in our house when this, especially as say my son's been uh, at home from nursery all week and is known to scatter everything everywhere. If that bot can manage to work, it, work its way around Lego, pick all those up, sort them out, I, I'm there. However much well, it is, I, I want it. Maybe the trick that they need to do is to have the base actually be a vacuum cleaner as well. I, I think it is. I did see oh, somewhere. It? it certainly looks like it could be one. But uh, yeah, if it can do all the laundry for me and if it can pour a glass of wine. So I come out the meeting and there's a glass of wine there ready. Yeah, I don't care how much it is. That That's that's it. I want one. So I have a couple of things with this. One, is it the handy bot or the bot handy? Because I keep seeing two names. I feel oh, they've missed the trick. They could have made they could have made the bot look like um, Johnny Five. Yeah. That was, <laughs> that's a definite <laughs> trick to this. You know, it's it, maybe it will come to life, get struck by lightning, and yeah, uh, yeah. exactly. Yeah, what handy is alive. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But yeah, um, bot, bot handy does sound more like the conversation we were having last time about CES, though. But uh, uh, that's a that's we a should probably move on very quickly now. I think so. Absolutely. Um, I think the only other one that you noted, Al, was uh, about Microsoft's plan to, which I think sounds great, convert everyone into bots. Uh, yeah, maybe not quite as positive as your bot handy and, uh, <laughs> and you know, pouring wine, but actually the ability to turn deceased people into AI chatbots. <laughs> it, it's very black mirror, isn't it? I mean, it's but it appears that Microsoft have actually submitted a patent for it. Mm. Um, I don't know whether they're just kind of, you know, stopping anybody else doing it, but it does feel a little macabre that they're going to even think about it. But and, yeah. and basically what they're saying is it will go and trawl through on social media posts, images, yeah. voice data uh, and allow you to carry on track someone. The, the thought of my wife talking to me in my kind of social media persona is just get, <laughs> terrifying i was gonna say you know gray hat beard you know there'll be so much media that they can pick up on to work <laughs> out you know how we how we act yeah i think our families would probably all feel rather alienated by a uh, this person a, a bot speaking like us but yeah, yeah. No, but, no but then you can just you just integrate that into the handy bot and it's basically you've got a human right <laughs> That's what you need yeah, to I, could, I could just put a hat on it and that was it that would be it done wouldn't it? yeah yeah I hadn't thought that. Yeah, my, my wife would just have a bot that showed her memes and uh, poured her wine. That might actually, that is that might quite actually accurate. Be, yeah, yeah, that might actually be an improvement. You know, if you're <laughs> cleaning the house and serving them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, moving. Yeah, move on, on. Move on. Um, I, I will put a link in the show notes. There was an interesting uh, concept from Nissan about having a, an office in a pod, uh, which uh, is worth a bit of a look. I'd love to know what people uh, thought of things there. Uh, in terms of ego posts, I'm not going to share this one, but I did a blog post about the uh, Lenovo ThinkSmart View, which is a standalone team. So if you're if you've got a Surface and you're finding that uh, Teams is using up a bit too much RAM uh, and you've thought about going for a separate device, have a, have a read of my review there. Uh, other interesting links, uh, Commsverse, uh, a great conference based in the UK that's uh, desperately trying to meet face to face one day. Um, poor um, Mark Vale kicked it off uh, just as the coronavirus started. 
um, but they've decided to put together the Tech Community Awards 2021. So if you're loving what people are doing in the community, then uh, yeah, go and have a look and and enter people. Nominate the Community Personality of the Year, Most Inspirational Woman Award, Rising Star Awards, Innovator of the Year, Best Community Blog, Best Community Podcast, if you wanted to think about that. Now, I, I'm going to be honest, I hadn't looked at all the uh, categories there, so I, I'm not pushing people too much. But if you did want to nominate your favourite podcast, uh, I'm sure the people who run that podcast wouldn't be too sad. Uh, but yeah, Best Community Com community that all, all sorts of ones so go and have a look get get sharing encourage people to do what they do and nominate uh, the ones they see through there uh we'll go on to events uh, i think al you've you're speaking tomorrow yep so south coast user group um all things microsoft workplace and power platform i'm talking about entitlements so if you do want to know more about the things we were talking earlier about how to set up permissions uh how to have users actually request those permissions to have them approved, granted, and then revoked after a period of time, then uh, come along to that tomorrow evening. Uh, and then later on in the week, I'm doing Collab Days Birmingham and talking about um, workplace analytics, which kind of harks back to that uh, that work lab we were talking about right at the beginning. Um, I need to mm. update my slides to reflect on the thing that might be of interest in there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so those are tomorrow, tomorrow evening and Thursday lunchtime at 1.20. I'd say Clap Days Birmingham's crept up very quickly. Feels like it should be in March or something like that. And <laughs> caught me by surprise. I hadn't even registered. So I've now registered for that one as well, which should be good. Um, I'm speaking at uh, Clap 365 Global Con 5 uh, tomorrow. So that's Tuesday 26th. Um, if you've ever tried to get a project about uh, getting a desk locator um, and spent thousands tens of thousands even in some cases hundreds of thousands you can now do it with microsoft search so come join that it's a quick 50 minute session all the sessions there are 50 minutes so if your attention drifts it is the perfect conference for you um other ones i think michael you've got a webinar coming up on thursday as well thursday yep 11 a.m pacific time so it'll be uh, a tad oh tad tad late for the UK viewers, I thought it was the other way around. So tad late for the UK viewers, but uh, we're doing it around um, a little bit around what to use when in Microsoft 365. Talking about some that's of the easy in Microsoft 365, isn't it? Yeah, no, it's so easy. They make it all of the tools <laughs> align nicely together in terms of capabilities and, and just turn and everything on. Just use it, right? <laughs> turn everything on and away you go. So no, so it's with um, it's with one of our partners, Matt Fishman from 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 Clarinet. So it should be should be a good one. Fantastic. Um, we also have uh, on Thursday, for those who love Twitter, I um, haven't really talked about these on the podcast that much, but Christian Buckley runs a, a monthly collab talk uh, tweet jam. So he has a set of uh, usually about six or seven questions uh, that puts out on there and a, a whole group of MVPs and other people in the community. And, and in fact, anyone can join and answer the questions. And uh, it usually triggers a bit of a good bit of discussion. So uh, this this week's one is how much community management is too much. So it'd be interesting to uh, see a bit of that. How much oversight is needed versus just letting people get onto it. Um, uh, Veronique, who we had on last time, is speaking at the Global Automation Boot Camp, uh, but no one else is. Is is that right, Gary? None of us <laughs> are, as, as far as we know. Um, I, I've. I've got an email to say I am speaking, I just I'm not on the website yet. Um, so yeah, I, I assume that I am. Uh, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm doing um, Azure um, managed identity uh, for for integration uh, with Logic Apps and uh, Microsoft Graph. So if you're a developer or even a Azure admin, and you know your authentication is always painful, you want to make your life a little bit easier than using Azure managed identity is one of the ways to do that. So, uh, so yeah, if that's uh, something you're interested in, then uh, check it out. Fantastic. Uh, and on the get the right to date for this one, that's the wrong link. Uh, 
Let's try and see. Seventeenth of Feb, we have the Microsoft 365 UK user group, which uh, I know Gary, you spoke at recently, uh, and I'll be talking on Microsoft Search on the seventeenth. And we also have on the 17th a grey hat beard session. So I, I'm not exactly sure on the name, some form of tech days events. Uh, Chris Huntingford uh, sent me a note over the weekend saying, would we like to speak? And we all said yes. So we're we'll talking on manage, monitor and secure the power platform. Uh, don't have any more details than that at the moment, but hopefully should be able to share something uh, soon on the show notes. Uh, and then the uh, actually penultimate one, 18th of Feb, Gary, you're speaking on the PMP community calls on uh, CLI for Microsoft 365 in Docker. Yeah, so uh, Docker release that we did recently. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to present, you know, how you can use that, how you can get up to speed with it, what 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 it's useful for, um, and how how you can kind of uh, you know leverage that um, that bit of tech uh, for your automations. Yeah, really good stuff there. Then 27th of Feb, we have the Scottish Summit coming, which uh, I think we're all speaking out in some vein. Uh, sorry, all of Grey Hat Beard speaking out in, in various veins. Uh, I think really everyone's events. speaking at Scottish Summit, I think. <laughs> There's about a million uh, uh, sessions. There are an awful lot of sessions there. It's yep. huge. Uh, and talking of a lot of sessions, then come March is Ignite. So uh, lots, lots and lots going on to keep up with. But for now, let's wrap up part one. Uh, I think Al's dream of us finishing on time is is skipping away by the minute, but let's try and see where we can catch up. So we'll we'll wrap up part one and get talking on our main topic in part two. See you all in a minute. <laughs>